Hello lovely people! It's a Thursday, which means it's time for another book chat, the regular but not monthly roundup of what I've been reading at some point in the past. Sophie Vlogs! I have six books to talk about this week. Four fiction, two non-fiction. I think I'm going to start with my fiction, bring it all home with some non-fiction. Starting with some books I read on my Kindle. I went on a long train journey to Manchester. I brought my Kindle along so I didn't run out of books. And there's certain types of books which are like the things I want to read when I'm on a train. Mainly, they're a bit lighter so that when everyone is chatting away in the train carriage you can still like get into your book. The first book I read on this journey was I Believe in a Thing Called Love by Maureen Gu. Um, this book was on my radar because of um, Monica at Monica Kim. Um, she's one of my favourite booktubers. I love her entire aesthetic look. Um, and so I just thought I'd give it a fun go. So this um, tells the story of Desi. Desi is at high school. Um, she's always been not necessarily unlucky in love, but every time she's around someone that she has a crush on, she just does ridiculously embarrassing things. One day, new boy starts at the school called Luca, who's like super cool, artistic type. Desi is Korean American, and her father is obsessed with K dramas, and she's always written them off, except for she catches one, and then she ends up binge watching loads of Korean dramas, and then she comes up with a formula that is the formula that K dramas follow, and she decides to apply this formula to her life. What this means is, is essentially this is like a fun teen rom-com where everything is, because it's deliberately drawing on K-dramas, everything is overdramatic and they get into ridiculous situations and that sort of thing, and that is like the whole point. Um, I enjoyed this. I've never seen any K-dramas, so I, I didn't have like that background knowledge. It was like a fun, over-the-top romance and with all these stage situations, and then as the book continues, she sort of starts to realise that maybe, like, staging these situations isn't always the best way to go about things, shockingly. There's a level of heightened emotion in this that is coming from the types of genres that it's drawing upon. I think slightly towards the end there were a few moments where I wanted things to stop being so constructed and I wanted her to just be honest. And I think that's deliberate. I think you're supposed to be seeing the limitations of the reason why you can't just use a television formula for your life, etc. It took her a bit longer to learn than I think I wanted her to. There were a couple of moments where I was like, it was starting to feel very much more manipulative rather than how it initially felt, which was like, she's a bit socially awkward, so she's following a formula because that helps her get through social situations, which is understandable and like a thing that people do. Um, but again, I do think that's deliberate. I think that is, you know, she has to really crash and burn to see that this thing that she's doing, it's not healthy and it would be healthier for her if she actually just felt confident enough in herself to, like, relax into that relationship and be herself and all that sort of thing. But it was absolutely perfect for my train journey. I had a jolly old time reading it. I read the whole thing in one journey. <laughs> After that, the other book I read on my Kindle was uh, Masquerade by Terry Pratchett. I um, have read some later Pratchett. Um, my first way into Pratchett was through the Tiffany Aiken books when I was a kid, but my parents have always been massive Pratchett fans, so like it's referenced a lot in my family and stuff like that. So for the last however many years I've been working my way through the books in the order they were published just because, I don't know, there's something very interesting about seeing an author's writing style develop, especially that I have read his later stuff and I know sort of where he ends up and Honestly, some of Terry Pratchett's later books are some of my absolute favourite books of all time. I think they're masterful. But also, having gone back and reread them from the start, there are ones near the start which I feel the exact same way about. So it's interesting seeing like the development of an author throughout their career. So Masquerade is a book that focuses on the witches. Um, and this time it is very much riffing off of Phantom of the Opera. We're in an opera house. There's a person who wants to be the star, but the girl who looks more traditionally like beautiful is the one who is the star, despite the fact that she doesn't have the voice for it. Um, and there's there's all of the, the plot points from Phantom of the Opera, but they've all got Terry Pratchett's twist on them. Um, I always really like Granny Weatherwax. She's one of my favourite characters. She's like, you know, a rod of steel, but also she leads to some really interesting, like, moral and emotional conflicts and stuff. Not necessarily her herself, but, like, the way that she interacts with people and the way that she solves situations and problems and stuff. And there's a real thread in this of, like, 
Granny Weatherwax is very powerful and things get a bit dangerous when witches get too powerful and how do you stop yourself from sliding into things which lead to you becoming like a big bad and stuff. That was a really interesting thread. Um, I think The Phantom of the Opera theme, this wasn't my favourite Pratchett but I still perfectly enjoyed it. It's just not one of the ones that like when it comes to me recommending Pratchett to people I wouldn't be like, oh you have to read Masquerade. There are other ones that I would recommend over the top. And I think partly that might just be because like Sometimes when something is riffing off of something that you know quite well, it's actually delightful, and other times it's just like fun and fine, and I think this one was like fun and fine, and I don't know if that's just because most of my phantom knowledge comes from like the stage show rather than the book, or if it's just like because it followed a lot of plot beats, I sort of was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> that was vague and rambly, I'm sorry. But suffice to say, this was a fun read. Pratchett's are always a fun read for me. Um, I thought there were some interesting things to do with like fulfilling the roles that people give to you, but also um, narrative power. Like if an, an archetype can take on lives of their own, and especially in Discworld, whereby when things start to take on lives of their own, they can affect the world and affect you and that sort of stuff. Like these things become they're not, not not just the idea of like a hero but like if you start to become that what does that do to you and all these sorts of discussions i thought there were some really interesting like disc worldy discussions going on like there always are um, and i enjoyed it i'm looking forward to doing the next one i try not to do them too regularly because like there's a finite number of them so i just intend to like spend my entire life like slowly eking my way through but it's always a fun time reading terry pratchett after that i read st thomas's eve by jean plady I know that this has been in the um, newer published versions of this, it has a different title now and I can't remember what the different title was but I don't really like it because <laughs> I feel like it posits the focus a bit differently and I can't remember what it was but I don't love it. Jean Plady is a historical fiction writer, I read a lot of her as a child, I have a couple of these which I haven't read yet which I've just been saving because again, eking them out because there's a finite number and blah blah blah. Um, this is focusing on Sir Thomas More. Um, who, if you're familiar with Tudor history, you'll know that um, he was a very learned scholar. He wrote Utopia. Um, he was beheaded by um, Henry VIII because of the whole kerfuffle of divorcing Catherine and marrying Anne Boleyn, and um, Thomas More was staunch Catholic and refused to give his approval to the marriage and then ended up being beheaded. This book focuses a lot on his eldest daughter, Meg, and it's sort of we get a bunch of different perspectives throughout this but Meg's story is sort of like the one that we keep returning to and we're getting like her perspective on her father and the events that are happening. Something I enjoyed about this was I felt like we had some nuance to our view of Thomas More. I read, um, I think it's called Portrait of an Unknown Woman. That might be an incorrect title but it's by Venora Bennett and I'll put it in the description below with the actual proper title which is uh, a a good comparison point for this book because that focuses on when Holbein came and stayed with the Moore family and did a portrait of them and that looks at the figure of Thomas More but it's much more damning it's much more painting him as an angry man um, who had a temper and who was uh, unwield, unyielding in his convictions and stuff which absolutely there, there has to be an element of that in a person to refuse to give your endorsement to something even though you know that it might lead to your death this one touches on that side of him but also balances it out with other sides of him which I found interesting because this gave a bit more there were moments in the plot where you see that unyielding temper and like iron that's at the centre of him and stuff but it also balances it out because it's looking through the eyes of his favourite child essentially it balances that out with Meg has this conflict where she sees these things in her father and she's she's shocked because they don't marry up with the very kind and very nurturing man that's brought her up. And then also um, the man that Meg married was a Protestant and he got involved in this um, circle of Protestants who were defying um, back when, before Henry was embracing Protestantism, who were defying like the Catholic Church and stuff like this. So there's an interesting look at her being in the middle of these two people that she loves who are both so sure of their convictions and Meg not even really caring which one of them is right but just trying to like broker a peace between them. I thought that Meg was an interesting lens through which to view this because she can see her father in he can, she can identify all of his flaws but she also has like a fundamental really deep strong love for him that guides everything she does so it's there's a conflict there that is interesting to marry against Thomas's lack of conflict in regards to should he support the marriage etc 
I don't know, this was fun. I've been getting back into reading historical fiction lately, I think it's because I've been my friend's just finished her masters and she's been writing some like Tudor historical fiction, so we've done like some days out in some Tudory themed places together, which has been really fun. And it's just getting me back into this period of history which I read a lot of as a child, and it's fun to dip my toe back into those waters again. So that was really good. My final piece of fiction is actually like an anthology collection, and that is We Were Always Here, a Queer Words anthology, um, edited by Ryan Vance and Michael Lee Richardson. This was fabulous. I say a lot of the time when I read anthologies, especially short story anthologies, that um, I struggle with them sometimes because they always get like a three star rating because some of the things are amazing, some of the things are not amazing. This is one of the best anthologies I think I've read. It's contributed by a lot of current Scottish LGBTQI plus writers. Um, it's a mix of short stories and poetry and they're all just centred around the queer experience but in all of the um, kaleidoscopic ways that that can um, that c manifest itself, you know, there are there's a wide variety of identities contributing to this as well as stories and poems that are set in like contemporary times that are like a lot of these really feel like they're drawing on like real lived experiences of the authors there's also some really interesting playing around with um, one of my favourites is one that focuses on like some supernaturally themes. It doesn't quite go into horror, but there's like a chill in the air going on. And there's another piece which is about like a, a or not like not quite post-apocalyptic, but a world that is on the brink of ecological collapse and um, people who are involved in trying to solve that. Um, and oh, I just it's so difficult to just sum this up because each piece in this there are so many thoughts and emotions that it evokes I just thought that this was a really wonderful glimpse into the variety of queer thought and expression but also when you read this there are themes that reoccur all the time because there are certain themes which um, if you're writing as a queer person about queer experience do have a tendency to pop up quite a lot and just every single person's voice in this it was really interesting to get their take and their perspective and that sort of thing. So I really enjoyed it. I thought it was absolutely cracking and um, probably one of the best um, anthologies I've ever read. So that's a fun thing. To continue the queer theme with my penultimate book, we've got Queer City, Gay London from the Romans to the Present Day by Peter Ackroyd. On a different train journey, I went to London for a medieval banquet experience, which was a time, um, and I thought it might be a fun I like to try and like link my reading to where I'm going sometimes, so um, I thought this would be a fun book to read while I was in London, and it was. Um, this is essentially like a potted history of London, and just like he uses queer. I would say that this focuses majoritively on um, gay male experience. He does try and draw on like female experience as well, but obviously um, a lot of historical sources that we have, especially when you go further back in this, which is where this starts, it starts um, sort of Celtic Roman times and then it comes forward to contemporary times. Um, a lot of these older sources we have are to do with male experience because you know, for whatever reasons, women are not educated, women are not given access to, like, writing supplies, or, like, they're not being preserved and prioritised, and that sort of thing. So he does make an effort to include women's experiences where he can. Um, I would say this does still focus largely on, like, gay male experience. So he does also look at, like, gender non-conforming experience and stuff like that. Um, I would say this was enjoyable. It does feel a little info dumpy at times. It is quite a lot of just sort of like we're going from, sometimes there wasn't really a clear narrative. So a lot of it is like listing things that we know about. And so like, we found this thing here and this is like, like molly houses and blah, blah, blah. So like occasionally, I read this in quite a short period of time because it was my book for traveling. Um, in many ways, I wish maybe I'd packed another book so I could have dipped into this and out of it and into it and out of it rather than just reading it all in one go because it did feel a bit listy at points. Um, another thing I would say, which is in regards to um, gender non-conforming people in this, he talks a lot in um, historical points about who, people who are gender non-conforming, so like people who um, are presenting as male and then there's like trials where they're being put on trial because everyone's like, you're a woman, you need to stop dressing up like a man, blah blah blah. Um, and then he tends to take the view when he gets more contemporary that like um, transgender people seem to be, in his opinion, a bit more of like a modern thing which I just found a bit weird. I know there's a discussion when it comes to historical and archaeological research where it's you can't really project 
modern identities onto people in the past because those were not concepts that they were aware of. I just think having given a lot of examples of gender nonconforming people, people who live their lives and, um, who, you know, there's lots of things in this about like so and so um, who there was lots of speculation, were they a man, were they a woman, and then after they died they were revealed to have a male body and blah blah. blah. All of these types of people, I would say it's a bit strange to then say that transgender people are like a modern phenomenon when you've been discussing gender non-conforming people in history, whether or not those people are explicitly like a trans man, or like a trans woman, or if they're just non-binary, or just negotiating outside of those two binaries that we set up, I think there is still, this has so much evidence of gender nuance in history that it seems weird to then be like oh we're living in the time of transgender people where it's like people have always been here who haven't always ascribed to a gender binary and i don't know that was another niggle and my final niggle <laughs> sorry i'm not i don't mean to complain too much but there, there were like critiques i have for this but my final critique would be is that we have a lot of info on historical london and then when it gets to quite a contemporary time i felt like we covered a lot of time quite quickly and not in a lot of depth, which was just a bit odd to contrast to so much depth in the history times that it felt a bit info jumpy, and then you get more contemporary, and then I actually would have liked a bit more information, a bit more stuff, because, you know, London is still a centre for queer activism and queer experience and stuff, and so it just felt a bit weird to, like, skim over that a bit towards more contemporary times. But then I don't know if that's just because he's a historian and then he's less interested in contemporary times. I don't know. But suffice to say, this was really interesting. It has introduced me to loads of stuff that I didn't know before. There was stuff I knew before, like I knew about Molly Houses and stuff like that. And then there's all this other stuff which I just had no idea about. So it was really, really fab. And I think it's a really good potential jumping off point as well because there's a lot of stuff in here that you could then go and do like further reading on yourself and that sort of thing. I just think it's also not a flawless narrative, but you know, swings and roundabouts. I'm really glad I read it. Worthwhile reading experience. Final book I'm going to talk about is A Little Bit of a Beast. <laughs> I read Vivian Westwood by Vivian Westwood and Ian Kelly, which is a biography of Vivian Westwood. A caveat, if you will. I did read this when I was off work with a cold, <laughs> so um, it's I don't know if I'm really going to be able to recall everything in it properly because largely my brain was like I'd watched way too much television and I was like I really want to read something I need to not look at a screen and I thought this might be quite good because it's like pictures of her work I thought might break up the reading experience so I will say um, as someone who was quite ill when reading it it was very accessible to read it was very easy to read that sort of thing um, it was interesting uh, Vivian Westwood is someone who I have conflicting thoughts on um, and I sort of read this to sort of try and muddle those thoughts out. One thing I will say is from a narrative point of view, um, the Ian Kelly, who's doing the biography of this, um, was a little bit too adoring of Vivian at times, I felt. I think I prefer my biographies to be... And when I say critical, I don't mean to be like, this person's terrible, but I'm going to tell you all about their life. I mean critical like just because your subject tells you something doesn't necessarily mean it's true that's their interpretation of an event absolutely but also maybe let's look at the dissenting voices let's maybe take a rounded look and if there are critiques to be had maybe let's look at those as well whereas this was just very <laughs> like the first chapter he's just like singing her praises and I was like absolutely you've kind of got to love the person that you're writing about to spend all of this time putting this together but at times it did just feel a little bit um, I wanted a bit more of like a sharper critical look I think. Um, this was so interesting though because Vivian Westwood has had such an interesting life like I had no idea about I knew her collections I'm familiar with what her pieces look like I was not familiar with the stories behind them so I knew a bit about her involvement in the punk movement and that sort of thing but then when she starts to move off and change her style a bit and do some other things that are not quite strictly punk um, that was really interesting to see what was the motivation behind that what led to those decisions um, I feel like her partner was a little bit of a terrible human being they do sort of talk about in this about how like everyone thought she was really really successful but also like she can barely afford to pay the bills because her partner's just like fucked off to America bit shit and also tried to like sue his own children <laughs> which is also a bit terrible so like um 
to to come from a point of really struggling to just even like pay your bills and be able to like live and feed your children and stuff because of all this turmoil that's happening in your personal life to like persevere through that to create these pieces to have such a successful career as she has had I do think that is absolutely amazing and it was super interesting to learn all about um, the ins and outs of that and stuff I think one of the things which is what I was hoping to get more clarity on which I didn't really get more clarity on is that I have a bit of a and I don't even know, I like I have like a, a conflict when it comes to Vivian's activism because Vivian Westwood is very well known for being an activist and I think that is brilliant. I think if you're good, you're find yourself in a seat of power to use that power to do good in the world is fabulous. Where I have some conflict is, is it's very hard because it's um one of her things is about eco activism, which is relevant now more than ever. This thing that she's been talking about for years is so relevant right now. You know, we are on the brink of an ecological collapse and we need to do something to help that, absolutely. It is difficult when it is someone who is sort of contributing to the fast fashion industry. Because, you know, I know that Vivian creates all these pieces by hand, which is for her runway shows. Um, it's quite hard to find out what her all the stuff in her stores is made. Um, someone told me that she uses sweatshops in Indonesia to make her clothes. I don't know if that's actually true. I need to do more research because it was kind of hard to find out online. But um, I actually would have liked maybe a bit more information in this about how those ecological, like how her passion for eco-activism is actually reflected in her pieces. In I want to know, <laughs> and if anyone has any info, please do tell me. I want to know not the pieces that are used for the runways in Paris and stuff like that. I know she does that by hand. The pieces that are sold in her store, how are they made? Where are they made? Are your workers paid a fair amount of money? How are you sourcing all your fabrics? Etc, etc, etc. I just, <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> saw that thing where like rich people are like doing all this activism and I'm like, wouldn't it be great if you also paid your taxes and applied those things to your own working career? Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> I don't know. Um, that sort of descended slightly. This is what I mean when I say I read this and I was quite ill. Um, everything sort of <laughs> was like coming through a haze to me. But um, interesting. Would have liked it to be a little bit more critical, a little bit more um, just like interrogating some of these things that are being said and being claimed. I would have liked like some further research and information backing those up. But if you're looking for more inter like more info into Vivian Westwood's professional relationship, personal relationships, her, her, how she creates clothes, what is the thought behind the clothes, all of that sort of stuff. Absolutely super duper interesting on that front. Those are all the books I wanted to talk about. As per usual, have you read any of them? Do you have thoughts on any of them? All of this and more. Please do talk in the comments down below. Otherwise, I will see you next week for something different.